So now let us take our journey from the waters to the lands of southern New York, and we will begin part three of our journey. So one of the maps I was most interested in, one of the maps that, that Asher asked for, was for a Duchess map, really, you know, state of the art. And I had done one uh, years ago when I was teaching at Vassar, and I was awarded the Helen Wilkinson Ruddles Award for Dutchess County Historian Lifetime title, whatever, not that I had any particular job to do. And, and it was a kind of a big hit. You know, there was all these historians, and the Dutchess County Historical Society sponsored it, and they were all there. And so I had this map. Everybody was, you know, looking at it with great interest. And it was that map, which was uh, not even three by four, but it was a pretty big map at that time. And uh, so I developed this idea of, of using yellow to highlight the areas where the populations would have been, like down the center of a, a big, you know, have this is kind of like a watershed for, this is the Matawan or Fishkill. And so the people are mainly living down in the valley and not on the ridge, generally. And uh, so I love the idea of like coloring in that with yellow. And so I've stuck with that pretty much in a lot of my maps. the red again of these trails and here we follow them they all seem to lead to uh, this place here you know we call uh, Danny's Point now but the original uh, for you know founders and settlers from Europe found Hachami which is a smaller tribe of Wapagers they found the Matawan which is a, a group of the um, Waranek Munsee and they found all these you know Wikipedia's and they found all kinds of different tribes coming because there's a major ferry crossing right here from Dennings Point over to the marina in Newburgh and then up to the trail that goes along. That's all part of Route 52, a very major trail that goes to the Delaware River in the west. So this is the major Hudson Crossing and here we are at Dennings Point. This is the place where everybody gathered to trade and to cross in their mohuls, which means tulip tree. And uh, so that's what they're named for the for the dugout canoe. So there was a period when I was getting a lot of requests to do talks in Ulster County about Ulster County. And so every time I do a presentation, I add to my maps and add different maps, sometimes little regional areas, but it all came eventually together into a big map of, of Ulster County. And I wanted to put everything in one, and I kept adding and adding. And it's, when it got to this point, I was really trying to get every single Native American place name there was in Ulster County. And maybe it's close, you know. But there's a lot more than you think. And these are, some of them are actually still current and some of them are historic. But when I was writing um, to the Native New Yorkers, I came across mention of this female sachem who was called the Sunk Squaw. And I was amused that the Dutch elders referred to this chief as Sunk Squaw, as, as if it was his name. Well, we met this very powerful chief, and this man was called Sunk Squaw, and I laughed because that means a female sachem. And then more research revealed that it was Mama Nokwe, or Mama Rose. And so I wrote a lot about her and her children in this book back in 2001 and two. But then when I was doing Ulster, she kept coming up, and it turns out that she signed a lot of the land treaties and, um, in order to maintain peace. And so she had sold um, basically Raga Wasink here and uh, some more of the Mogul Wersink territory, which is where Chopinik Falls is. And Chopinik is a great name. Asho always means forceful as a prefix. And Pe, Pe is drinking water. And Nyak is a prominent place of land, like a big rock cliff. And it certainly is. In the springtime, it's a forceful sp uh, creek, forceful waterfall. Uh, at a prominent rock place. So Chopinik, and I learned about that from uh, some of my friends at Bruderhof who go there for picnics. Now, um, she kept coming up various times and more and more as I kept studying. She lived in High Falls, which was Sunkhadasink. And I found that in a deed for the area that I live. And I found it in the New York Book of Land Records. And I went to Albany and looked it up on microfilm actually got a copy of that deed for her daughter Dostu, 1700. And she sold parts of the land that Mamanukwe had as 
lands or personal lands. I can't go into detail because people have asked for confidentiality. But High Falls was called Sunk Hadassim. That means that's the headwaters. Uh, Han would be tributary. T is the council fire, as you recall. And Sink is the place. So it means the council fire place at the head of this tributary. Wait. And so there's a perfect spot there at the lower falls of High Falls, which is a double fall, perfect for council fires. And it's within a mile of where I believe she lived. And so she could have walked there and held her famous councils. No, she was very eloquent. And she's, uh, she gave a famous peace speech when, the, uh, you know, when King Philip's War broke out. And so the English wanted to know, so are you going to, are you going to attack us? You know, they wanted to know, are you going to do war with us because these other people? And she said, she said, she didn't say yes or no, but she said, we all want peace just as much as we want the warm summer sunshine or springtime sunshine that shines in the morning on the dew and makes the birds sing and, you know, and elaborate. But we all want peace. Goodbye. And she never answered the question. But it was a Gandhi moment, you know, and it actually firmly set her on the side of peace as a goal. And they never had war in New York, in lower New York, with this open thing. Um, in that war where a lot of people died on both sides. Uh, so she was a great peacemaker. So this is a map of the treaty territories from Ulster County. So this follows the other map. So as I was doing the research for the Ulster map, I found I could actually date some of these treaties. And it has to do with Mamanukwe. Now I have to confess to you, I've had this love affair with this woman who's been dead since 1685, and it's a little weird. But I really like what she did as this section, as a, you know, some spot. And she, when the Dutch were overrunning her territory, she made sure they paid for everything and that everybody had a clear understanding so they would be at peace. And one of the things she did, she actually walked across the top of the Shangnan River, no small thing, along the certain trail that's still there and not paved to sign the Treaty of New Paltz in 1677, along with Manvet and some other female leaders, other Munsi leaders, and uh, other Dutch leaders, the Huguenots. So Mama Nokwe was around and she signed, you know, Nipple Street, she was there and some of her family members were there in 1665 and it's a beautiful effort at diplomacy. And then they renewed the treaty supposedly every year and there were like 17 of these renewals and she signed several, including one where she prominently drew her own self-portrait at the bottom joyfully firing an arrow, which, again, her sense of paradox was delicious, right? So yeah, I'm real friendly, I'm gonna shoot you with an arrow. Um, but anyway, this was a very important treaty, and it obviously had this, you know, this territory that included all these Muncie villages. A lot of them maybe lingered and stayed Han, but Kahak Singh was the original name of the Rondau, and that Kahak is a, a goose, and Singh is place. It's very clear as a place to wild geese which is why the Rondout Valley School System has the mascot of the wild goose. I had heard about this, the Papton Trail long ago, but I didn't really know where it is, or if anyone really knew where the Papton Trail was. And so then I started to try to figure it out, and I realized that some of it must have been Route 28, which you know goes west. And, and yet this whole section of 28 here uh, couldn't have been a, much of a portage because it goes over Hurley Mountain Ridge. And so I realized it was a lot more complicated than I originally thought. I know some of it went along the Sophus, and some of it went along 213 and then through west. It, it got complicated. So then I called James Foltz, who's the New York State historian, and he helped me with Native New Yorkers. So I called him out of the blue and I said, okay, so where's the Pacton Trail? Does anybody know? He said, well, I have a map of it. I said, bring it. So he sent me the map. It's a hand-drawn map from 1777, drawn by some, some assistant to George Washington, as they were marching troops out, and it became more and more interesting. So I was trying to figure this out. I said, well, you know, Foltz's map really is, is of this Papacton Trail, and the Papacton Trail takes a turn here. This red line here is Papacton Trail, as it was just saying, but it goes off of 28 and then follows 30 here. 
very clearly, very easily goes to Papakon and then to Pacton. And then the question everybody wants to know is, well, what was going on here? And we just don't have that much evidence. And I think it's mainly that the natives knew all this and were traveling back and forth between the, the East Branch, or what we call the East Branch Township, uh, themselves and didn't really tell the colonists too much about it. And then you get to the Delaware here, which of course is your real uh, you know, destination. Show you one of the main things I want to show you is that this one small county has several different Algonquin tribal groups all related to the Muncie. So you have the Minisink Muncie here, which I mentioned. This whole area is Minisink, a very large group. And here's Minisink Island, which is the capital of all the Muncie, right there in the Delaware River. And um, so that color represents this side. This is called the Minisink Valley. Okay, and then this yellow area is the Weronix. Uh, who were associated with Orange County, and they are a very complex group that shows up, the Wernicks show up everywhere. They show up at Dennings Point, they show up in New England, they show up here. And this means, some people translated it as the place of the wise men. I like that. The Wernick, you know, it really means like a beautiful, a beautiful camping area where the water comes out, more literally. But also in another layer of meaning, it could be the place of the wise men. Uh, so that whole area, and here's the Wernick Trail, which is 52, going off to the Delaware. Now, this is the Sconanoke Trail, Route 207, and this whole green area, and this is one of the main interesting things about this map, is that this whole area apparently was the Sconanoke area. Sconanoke means uh, grapes, wild grapes or muscadine grapes, and it implies that they're very sour. Um, Sconanoke, there's various layers of meaning, all pointing to sour grapes. And Blooming Grove was a big native area, it still is in a way. But there's only like, in the county history books, the really old books, you find maybe two references to Sconanoke's, but there it is, and it's an Algonquin word. And the native people remember them and talk about it. Um, occasionally mentioned that early on in my life, I married into a mini sink family, mixed blood. Many sink, and uh, I got this request to speak to the Orange County Historical Society and give a talk. And I didn't have a map, so I had to make one pretty quick. When I got there, there was uh, my uncle-in-law, by the way, who had apparently kind of signed me up, suggested I come. So I was really glad I had this nice map. Well, this is a second version. The first one kind of went over the end, you know, when you don't plan ahead. So this one has the whole of Orange County, and it has the Many sink region over here. And uh, oh, here at Minisink Island is right at the mouth. You see maybe the wolf's head of Orange County. Ulster County also is a wolf's head going in a different direction. But this is, a lot of people clear, clearly see the wolf's head here. And uh, what happened was, is that the, um, he used to go all the way into the river, but then they cut his head off. They put a collar on him, I like to say. They put a collar in uh, 1800. And uh, so now we have its neck starting here. But what's interesting about Orange County, not only does it point west to Minisink Island, which is at his mouth, you see his mouth here. And here is him drooling here. This is actually the, you know, this uh, Basher Kill. That's that whole river that connects all the way north. And here's the Shawangunk Creek, which is the border for this county for quite a ways. But then you have, of course, these red lines or these highways, which are old, almost all old trails. You have some, a couple of really important things that I want to point out. So let's start at the bottom. So you have the Ramapo territory here, at the very bottom. And then you have the Tuxedo land, which means the round-footed ones. And the uh, round-footed ones, of course, is the wolf. So the Ramapo and all of this Muncie here identify with the wolf. So Tux is circular or round. So they're round-footed ones up here, and that was where the tuxedo was invented, in tuxedo, which is a Muncie word. And, uh, and then you have this trail coming through here. So this is Ramapo territory. Now this is Miss Tucky, and that's Warwick today, but much bigger than Warwick today. It's a huge city, a very wealthy city in terms of trade, because over in the Pochak Mountains, there were mines. There were lots of minerals, very valuable minerals, even then. And they would wash up after a storm and they trade them. There were so many 
amazing things about this area of all these gemstones. And even today, it's you know, greatly known for gemstones. Miss Tucky means the uh, place, the place of the uh, trees whose leaves are the color of blood. So Miss is like red or the color of blood. Tuck in this case is a tree, and Aki is land. So it's the land of the trees whose leaves are like the color of blood. And the Goshen Turnpike is still still here. See, that's the important trail. Here's Route 17, which is really the Onakwaga Trail, but I have found that it was called the East-West Trail for sure. That's in the, very little known, but it's in the Kalinga Records. Route 17 is the East-West Trail and it covers a large territory. You're going to have the Onakwaga, which I mentioned earlier. Here's the Keshekton Trail, Route 17K, and that may be a series of small trails that you know, the uh, Yankees, the Connecticut Yankees used to get to Keshekton, which is way over here. Duchess Cory Cave is actually a Duchess Cory in Dutchess County, but this was an additional property they bought to develop, and there's a cave there. It's very important and very sensitive, and people should make sure that it's always preserved because they're digging and excavating closer and closer. It's right off of this, right off of this trade route here, and it's closed down. So uh, we want to preserve all these different sites as best we can. So that's it. So um, now we we're going to go live uh, back to Evan in the room. Um, he has your questions that have been going into the chat. And we have time now um, before we do the last part of our presentation um, where Evan is going to answer a few of them. So we've had some interesting questions in the chat. And, uh, I'll he might uh, answer it's brief, but we're also going to come back to these questions later on towards the end. We still have another little segment, but uh, you know, if I don't get to your question, wait till the end of the program. But uh, I want to mention that uh, Jennifer Starlot has asked, what's the difference or connection between Algonquins and Lenape? And Algonquins go really coast to coast and in Canada, what's now Canada and the U.S., uh, from PEI and uh, Nova Scotia all the way to the Pacific. And the Algonquins out there are called macro Algonquins, and it's really not quite the same. But all the way to the Rockies, you have the uh, main Algonquin group. And that's not what we call ourselves. We call ourselves the Kijia Kubwogan, which means the people of the deer skin, the people who wear deer skin. And uh, it's a very ancient term. Um, but there are 84 major tribes. And by major, I mean you've probably heard of them. And they speak some kind of, we all speak some kind of Algonquin language. And uh, so that's that in terms of Lenape, that's a sort of an ad hoc term. It is a word in Muncie and in Unami. It means ordinary people, ordinary men. Uh, but trying to make it into a territorial term is very difficult because it wasn't used that way, at least not as far as the colonists knew. And uh, the Moravian uh, mission, missionaries were very respectful overall, and they were trying to convert them, but they were also very interested in the native life. They work very closely with these groups. And I asked the uh, head of the archives in Bethlehem, you know, when does this term actually show up in the records of the Moravians? They said, well, like, uh, how about, you know, uh, 17, 1790? So, wow, that's already the United States. And it was out in Ohio. It's the first time they've heard that term. So, uh, you need to examine and re-examine the term, but it is a term that everybody knows, Lenape. So trying to uh, use it as this technical term is a little rough because it, it has become a cultural term for a cultural area. And you could interpret it all these different ways. You could say the Lenape area goes from the Canadian border all the way down to the Potomac, but then the Mohicans don't call themselves Lenape. So that's, uh, you know, that doesn't work. But you could say, Okay, so Muncie and Unami, but some people feel that it's mainly the Unami who could be called Unami. The Muncie don't always call themselves that. So the word is is a very useful word because often these different tribal groups all might be found living together in colonial times, and so you could you want to say something Lenape. I use the word Lenape sometimes in Native New Yorkers, but I'm mostly mostly focusing on Muncie. And so there are others like there's a uh, Hulu Nixta is another word for that 
what people would call the Napi language. It's their own word in the language. So uh, use the word when you have to. And uh, if you can use Munsi or Unami, it's much more clear and, I, to me, respectful of the culture. That's a short answer. <laughs> but I hope that's uh, interesting. Are the Wappingers Mohicans? Well, that's uh, an astute question because some Wappingers call themselves Mohicans and some don't. And um, really, it's a different language. So looking from a linguistic point of view, um, you know, uh, Hendrik Appelma wrote the whole catechism in Mohican, and there isn't an R or L in the book. And that's how Mohican is. It's still, you know, a, a traceable language, understandable language, and it doesn't have that feature. It's much more of a, an old, like, Canadian Anishinaabe-like language with no R or L. Or Wappingers, uh, it's very clear from the place names and the names of the leaders that they had R in the language, not in so much an L, but uh, it was a heavily R, and that really comes from the influence of both the uh, Wangunks of Connecticut and also probably Taino. And you're saying, well, why Taino? Well, a lot of studies have been done, and uh, you know, look at uh, some of this you know, William Ritchie's book, and book of Archaeology in New York, which is published by New York State, and he suggests that kind of uh, possibly Taino influence throughout the area that we now think of as Wappingers, and talks about some archaeology which suggests Taino. And it just keeps coming up over and over again. I was probably the first person to write about the Taino in New York in a book form. And it seems to be, uh, I think, holding up pretty well. Um, but Taino has an R, which can be traced back through uh, all the way from Venezuela and the, you know, other nations down there. So I would say this is one of those many Algonquin questions that can't really be answered simply. Are the Wappingers Mohicans? Well, some were, and, and some wouldn't identify with that. But yes, I think actually the Mohicans were their uncle, and they evolved out of a mix between, you know, that whole area, the Wappingers area was, uh, you know, was Mohican and then Muncie and then Wappingers with that influence. So it changed over time, and it ended up getting all mixed together. So um, it's like I say, linguistically, I would have to say it's a little different, quite a bit different. Uh, but they themselves often would call themselves Mohines. Now, in my map of Dutchess County, you'll see that there were territories divided up that most people don't know about. And again, uh, Helen Wilkinson Reynolds and her book about Poughkeepsie, the origin and meaning of the name, which is a very obscure little booklet you can find in research libraries, but it does suggest that there were territories which still were considered Mohican. And then that changed right up until, say, the revolution. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Yeah, we appreciate those answers to folks' questions. And uh, we are logging all the questions. We'll have time for a few more at the end. Um, but also, we did put uh, Evan's email in the chat, and we can also uh, provide those to him at the end to follow up with folks. Uh, before we go to part four, I did want to give our deepest thanks to video producer Edward Gibbons-Brown, who worked his magic with our recorded presentations today and without whom uh, we couldn't have made this happen. So our great thanks to him for, for his help. Um, and so now we are going to head into part four, the final part of our tour presentation today, where we will journey to the source and discover the significance of place names and learn what they can tell us about the Algonquin perspective. Helen Wilkinson Reynolds' book, Poughkeepsie, the Orange and Me of the Word, I found this Teague Pak Sink name, which I had not seen in any other book, but immediately knew what that meant. Because Teague is, a, Teague is a kind of a, a tributary of sorts with a tidal invocation. The T is a council fire. Pak means flat, and Sink is a place. So it's like, oh, it's the flat place where there's a council fire, and there's a flat place near Prey Pond, which is the headwaters of the Fishkill, or the Mashawan, which means trout stream, and the Dutch were a little vague, so they said, well, fish, you know, it traps a fish. And so it goes through the Matawan, this whole area would be the Matawan Indians naming themselves after the creek, after the tributary, at the Fishkill Hook, which was where Daniel Linen once lived, 
and then you go all the way to the source, which is Cray Pond. Well, it's interesting because uh, the custom is always to go to the headwaters to pray, because for one thing, even now, the source, the waters of source, we call them sweet water springs, because the water comes out of the ground is pure. And as it comes down, it becomes impure until it gets into the river, even that. And so people would go on a pilgrimage upstream to the source to find purity, to find, it was like the looking for God in a sense, you know, the purest reality or looking for yourself, for your own birthplace, right? So uh, if this goes through your village, you would follow it sometime in your life. So then you go to pray. So I saw this pray pond. I said, this has got to be an Algonquin translation. So I took a journey myself up the fish kill to the source, and it turns out that there was all these cemeteries, and they all everybody's name was Prey. And so I'm stumped. And nobody seems to be sure were these people Lenape or Muncie in this case, or Wappingers, or is that just their English name? Well, nobody knows. We have to assume it's their English name. So it may not be what it obviously is. But this whole area was treaty together very early. It was called Clo Valley, and this is called the Clo, you know, where the roadway, which is the Clo Valley path, all the way from, almost from the river, 82, and it splits off. This is all County 9, or Beekman Road. That's all this Clo Valley path. It goes all the way over to Swamp Creek, way over on Route 22, which is an international trade route. It goes from Montreal to Louisville, Kentucky, and broken, that's like, we call it, the, it's like the turtle's back of the Great Turtle Island. That's the turtle's back. It's like the Great Turtle Island, you know. And then um, Route 22. So that's where it, where it ends. But, uh, you know, it's kind of a mystery as to whether it means praying or it's a family name. But people, everyone still calls it the Clove with great pride. It's a beloved area of Dutchess County. So that was kind of nice how that turned out. And, you know, the, there was, this was called Fox Point by the Wampagers. And it's interesting that Marist chose, where I taught for 15 years, they chose the fox as their mascot. And the reason why is because it's honoring the Native Americans in a subtle way. And here's uh, Winaki Falls. Uh, Winaki is more of an old Mohican word meaning lovely uh, land, the love of the land. So it doesn't seem to re refer so much to the waterfall or the creek that it might. But even Helen Wilkinson Reynolds said, well, it really probably is just the land because it says so. You can take it what it says. And she said that this was, um, Wappinger's Creek was really, the whole thing was actually named more um, Mawinawasik, which means where the beautiful rivers all gathered together. <clears throat> and so that makes sense because they almost never named themselves, they almost named, they almost never named the rivers after themselves, what I'm trying to say. Um, they would name themselves after the river. So Mawinawasik is the name of a river because the waters gathered together, whereas Wabinders means men of the east. So why would a river be called men of the east? So here you have it kind of outlined. And um, so Mawinawasik is where Salt Point is. And here is where the little Wappingers comes together with the main Wappingers and creates a point here. And there was a longhouse they found the remains of right on that butte. Here is one of my favorite little, that's our little mascot here, it's the Mastodon. And so there was a, a treaty in 1696 with the Dutch where this Aqua Nessing people, you know, sold their land. Aqua Sing or Aqua Nessing. So the Nessing ending means a muddy place or a Sing is a place. But the Aqua was mysterious and people disagreed as to what Aqua means. Well, I was listening to a lecture by the current Munchie chief, um, you know, who is uh, Mark Peters, who was a former Muncie chief, and he helped me write Native New Yorkers, by the way, so it would be exactly accurate. And I heard him on a view, a Zoom view, and he was talking about this aqua way word in Muncie, which is not in the dictionaries exactly, but it means mastodon. So they have a word for mastodon. And so I thought, aqua, okay, aqua nesting means the mastodon of the Muncie place. And then I said, wait a minute, there was a mastodon dug up in a muddy place in Hyde Park, which is where the aqua nesting people lived in 1990. So I found the article, I helped, we found that article, and 
that methadone is now in Ithaca, and there's pictures of it, and then I went to the site that it was found, and just as they said, they built a fountain there to memorate the place so that everyone could always know where this methadone was found. So this is the methadone that apparently gave its name to the Aqua people, who then moved west into Ulster County, and that's, you know, another map, oh wait, the Aqua people. So that's just a taste of all that's on this map. But again, this was very much like a, how do you say, special. There was one more thing, there's Putnam County, and one of my favorite spots, of course, Indian Brook hasn't really changed much. But I mentioned Pasquasque, which is really on the opposite of Cold Spring, you have what's Storm King now. But here is Kiskiskan. Now that's something I had found in a library somewhere, probably the Library of Congress. I used to go down there and Xerox everything, and um, or photocopy. Kiskiskan, I saved that paper, and that was decades ago. And then I was doing this math and I lost this. I gotta find that paper, and I found it. And I found Kiskiskan. And that's for this whole garrison area. And then I thought about Kiskiskan, okay, so Kesk is uh, prominent and Kisk is from the sun and Conk is a big rock. And so then I found Keskiskan Castle is actually this whole area here, uh, is it Fort Defiance, I think it's called right here in, in um, Garrison. And it's perfect because it's this high cliff, it's very rocky and the sun hits it no matter what. It can be a cloudy day and the sun will eventually hit the spot. And so there was apparently an Indian fort there which gave Washington the idea, oh, you must have a great view from here. And he went, and sure enough, an incredible view, sweeping view of the Hudson River for tens of miles. You can see everything that's going on, it's a perfect sight. And so he built Fort Defiance there. And it's right off of Route 9, the Mohican Trail. And uh, so it's a beautiful space. So I'm, I feel confident that Keskiskan refers to that spot. But there were several Keskiskan villages down here as well along 9D, which is another trail. And uh, <coughs> And Canopus is very interesting. I'll just mention they have this Canopus Creek going through the same area, and uh, Oscawana. And these two kind of go together because Quanopius means like this long, shallow uh, river of drinking water. But then the Dutch change it to Canopus, which is a constellation that you see over the Library of Alexandria in Egypt. And so what it suggests with the Dutch naming it this is that the people who would gather here were wise sages just like the scholars from ancient times would gather at the Library of Alexandria. So it was a big compliment, name it Canopus, because that's the constellation that marked that spot. The next one is Oscawana, which really means the, the tributary that's named after the buckhorns. And the buckhorns is what those same chiefs would wear when they were meeting and holding office because they, they didn't attach themselves to the power of their job. They would say, well, it, I'm just wearing that hat. And it's, I have no personal you know, credit by being chief. It's just for the tribe. So when they're meeting, they'd, pull, they'd wear the buckhorns. And I've seen them. They're like a cap of leather. And then these buckhorns, large horns, sticking out. And then when they were done, they would lay the hat ceremoniously on the ground. And so Oscawana suggests that. So that's just some of the highlights. And of course, Polo Pell Island is right off of, uh, you know, right off of here at Onyx Point. Polypel is now called Bannermans, but Polypel is a Dutch word meaning a ladle, and it doesn't look like a ladle. But what it is is Polopiel means the rock that plows the water, and it's very imaginative. Like I said, if this guy who named this island were in my poetry class, I'd give him an A because it's so poetic. So you flip the river upside down and imagine it's plowing the river, but it's also in the middle. It means it divides the river too, which divides it as a crossing. So he'll end my comments on this map with, with Bannerman, Paul Lopel, the rock that plows the water. I want to talk about the region, very interesting region up here. Gawiensink is, is now Pine Hill, and there's a lot, there's the Pine Hill Community Center and a lot of Native American lore, but Gawiensink is a rare case of the Iroquoian and Algonquin words mixing in a portmanteau, because Gawian is to me, clearly, from the Seneca word used by Hanson Blake, meaning universal harmony, Gaiwio. And Gaiwien is plural, I believe. And Sink is a place in Lenape or in Lensi. So you have the, the place of universal harmony. 
And so it apparently was a spot where Handsome Lake's followers would stop along their portage route, because there's a portage that goes right through there, jumping over from Birch Creek over to the other side, other side of the ridge into the Delaware Valley. So they would have to stop there, and apparently it became a kind of a, I would guess from that name, was some kind of religious spiritual meeting for the, you know, the Gospel of Handsome Lake whose popularity peaked around 1812. Oh, it's interesting how this whole area is Shen Dakin, and there was a fort down here, and then uh, near the Beaver Kill, and the fort was actually probably made by a chief, Shen Dakin, who actually came from way over in Green County, and then a pine orchard area. His, according to legend, his daughter was killed, and then he went on a journey, and he went across the uh, some these trails, these back trails, to get to uh, Shandakin, probably this one. And he ended up there, built the fort, I believe. And then a settler came and uh, decided he needed a place to live, so he moved into the fort. And then George Washington, during the Revolution, said, hey, Clinton, make me a fort. So he chose that one. And he made that fort in under three weeks. So that's really fishy. You can't make a fort in three weeks. Obviously, he took the Indian fort turn it into a military fort in a good location. So a little background on Shen Dakin. I did the, uh, the Dutchess County map, and there was this Aquanessing group that held, sold their land and moved somewhere. And I was wondering, where did they go? And then I was working on this, and I found this book, The History of New Paltz, by, by Ralph Lefevre, who was a descendant of the original colonists. And he's got Aqua, tribe, Aqua people, all over. Here's Aqua here, and uh, over here, and uh, let's see, where's Libertyville, the Aqua, and Owl Church. What a name, Owl Church. So the Aqua people were there, they were there. So they're all over this area, all these Aqua people. So that's got to be the same people, because then again, it doesn't mean anything exactly, except Macedon, it's like the root. And yet, that's never really been published, but again, Mark Peters does. So, so kind of all those pieces finally fell together. So the Aqua stayed in Ulster County a long time and actually lost their land to a technicality somewhere just before the American Civil War. It's shocking, you know. And they have a burial place in the, the old burial site. So that's one aspect to this. Amistra is a story in Rumantanac. Uh, was a tribe that came over from the east, landed here, and then the Dutch came along and said, well, we'd like to buy this land, and they said, well, so would you like to know what it's called? They said, well, no, we just need the land, we got to plant right away. You sure you don't want to know what it's called? No, we don't. So they sold it to them. And then a year later, they came back and said, we can't grow anything. Nothing grows, this is solid clay, it's like a brick. Now would you like to know what Romanchinac means? Is it okay? It means a terrible place to grow corn. We didn't ask. So. What the Dutch did was very clever, and they decided to make bricks out of it because it was already pretty much like a brick. But even that was difficult. So then they read their Bibles, and they found a Bible that says that, you know, the Jewish slaves added oat straw to the bricks and the clay, and that made them much better bricks. And so they added oat straw, which in Dutch is haverstraw, and so it became a straw, haverstraw in New York. And it's still there, and it's now the National Brick Museum is located there and Zaki, where the ground is broken up. Nakpim, where the fog rises. Sintsink, where it's very stony. There's a spot there, a little creek by the train station. All these little potato-like stones, millions of them. Little stones, Sintsink. And I mentioned Tichuan, Matawan, which is trout stream. Um, you know, Wunaki, the lovely land. So, um, so I just wanted to show you that. And there's a different color for each of these, basically these different subclasses. They're all Algonquin speaking people. And they all work together in a kind of a harmony, the way that all the waters of the tributaries all run together into the Mohicani film. This whole system is all built up over what was already here rather than building new stuff. And so this map shows you to a great extent exactly how all of that work and how the transportation works. <laughs> We are getting close uh, to wrapping up, and so at this stage, we 
are going to go to Evan, who is going to give us a quick tour through Rockland County. And so Evan has the map there behind him. And so he will give us a uh, quick tour through this area. And then we will end with a little bit more Q&A. So I want to show you the Rockland County map. And this was uh, used to work at the Stony Point Conference Center. And they asked me to uh, do something, you know, do programs for Indian education, so to speak. So we ended up deciding to make a map. And uh, a woman named Kitty was a co-director. And she suggested it'd be a good idea to make a big map so everybody can see it. And we can put it outside and, and watch. And this was that map. And this is um, sort of the, you can see it, the green area is the Papan area. But it was originally, the whole area was Papan Indians. And Papan is from uh, the word for a cold tributary. On, and then uh, that became the Spark Hill Creek, which is still there. And um, then it, you know, changed. So this is part of that too. But this is Romantinac area that I mentioned. And uh, this is Nariel. Now that became Nyack, but that was from a group in Brooklyn that were having a lot of trouble with the Dutch and getting into wars with the Dutch. And so they asked the Tapan, who were more of the, uh, I would say, administrators of the area that, you know, they'd like some land. So they said, come on over and you can live here in what was called the Tappan Hills. And so uh, they came and settled and, you know, survived by trade rather than like it's hard to do farming there and fishing. But through trade, they were able to prosper <laughs> as the Nyack people. And so that's that gray area. And I like to talk about that. Uh, fact that it means a, a breezy translation of Nyack is a place to stand where you can see far. I like to point out that you know when Pete Seeger was in elementary school, he lived in Nyack. And I like to comment, well, you know, maybe he somehow got this idea because I always felt like he found a place to stand politically where he could see far into the future and, and see some of the environmental problems that were coming down the river and that's part of how this institute of, uh, you know, rivers and estuaries came into be. It's a long story. But also, I want to point out that this orange part over here, uh, I found, was taken over, so to speak, by various small Ramapo settlements. And I found that out because I came across the notes of an uh, article written by Frank Speck, who was one of the originators of what we call anthropology or what some people call it anthropology, but uh, you know he was a diligent scholar and he wrote down all these encounters he had with Ramapo people throughout the area, and so I used that as a basis for this whole mapping. This is all the Ramapo settlements throughout Rockland County, but originally it was quite a bit of Tapan people throughout. Now Tapan is a very important group, and I have a book I wrote called "The Tapan: The Keepers of the River Crossings." So they were kind of in charge of Hudson and keeping everything flowing, traffic both ways on the, the ferry boats and also up and down. And uh, as it turned out, the Tappan Z Bridge came to us when I was younger here. The Dutch named it, named this inland sea, which you see here, after the Tappan, and thanks to them because the Tappan clearly helped the Dutch get a foothold. Only very recently, however, the Tappan Z Bridge was our main connection to the Tappan people and the town of Tappan. And, uh, and then somebody changed the name of the bridge, so the word Tappan was no longer in usage. But a lot of people, even weather reporters and news people, continued to use Tappan Z Bridge in defiance. And uh, there's people talk about it coming back. The point is we need to understand the Tappan people and their role in history and to never forget them. A lot of them actually kind of went west into the Ramapo Mountains, became ancestors of the Ramapo. And uh, there's a lot of crossover. So this happened as a major part of that. So, so this map shows a lot of these. Uh, Kakyat Kawaki, by the way, is a great place named, um, which is considered Ramapo. And there's a spook rock, which is, I visited, which is on a, a crossroads between two trails. And it's a rock with a kind of a, place underneath it where people could uh, do a vision quest. 
So spook is actually a Dutch word for spirit. So it's really the spiritual place. Um, and there's a lot on the map and on some of the old river names. Now over here is Mawa, and that was derived from the, a place, you know, Mawin having to do with gathering. So that was the capital of Aramapo for a long time before contact and in the early contact period, meaning that's where people would go to gather Aramapo and it's still called Mawa. And there's a lot of Aramapo people still living around there. So that's just a little bit of introducing, introduction to that. Now on the other side of the river, there's Mina, which means, you know, Indian Point. It was really called Mina, which is oysters. And uh, that was called Indian Point because of the powwows that were held there around 1900 and that whole decade. Thus you have the Manitou Mountains. The whole area was called Manitou. And then they kept renaming the different mountains until there's this one Manitou Mountain. And now we have Manitoga, which is a made up name honoring the native ancestors. So that's what's on that map. And uh, I have a favorite uh, story about a Johnson town was one of these Ramapo townships or settlements, really. And so I, uh, you know, when he's an American, goes into whatever you want to call him, non-native person goes in and says, he's going through the woods and he just sees woods and he doesn't see any recognition to him of, you know, a town and see, meets a native running through the woods, and grabs him and says, excuse me, I'm looking for a Johnson town. And I'm lost here in the woods. He says, you're in Johnson Town. This is the center of Johnson Town. So he got suddenly a whole different perspective on what a town was. And uh, so that's one of my favorite stories. Because uh, it gives you a different idea. So this ferry crossing is one of the most important. These dotted lines again, right here, sometimes called King's Crossing by during the Revolutionary Period, but also um, one of the most important crossings, maybe in North America, because it's a prominent crossing for the Hudson River, and it goes right into Miniskiango area, which is actually references the Minising Munsee, the river of the Minising Munsee, and it goes to connect to East Main and then West Main, right in the town of Stony Point, and there is a center now, a Native American cultural center in Stony Point called the Sweetwater uh, Cultural Center, and I'm involved in that, and they have a big copy of this map right there, and it's kind of laid out horizontally, but they have uh, different activities there, and they have a number of my maps there. And again, the Ramapo are part of the administration. So those are some of the highlights that I wanted to mention briefly. And uh, so I think that mentioned also there's a split rock, uh, which is a natural feature right down on the border here, split rock at the border. And there's plans that have been involved in over a long period of time to eventually have a like, really major cultural center near Split Rock. And that's right on the, the border. And there seems to be a natural uh, alignment with uh, solstices, which is very curious. So I'm going to stop there in terms of that. And I know you've had some very interesting questions. And um, I'm not sure how to access them, but hold on. I know. OK, so uh, in terms of the word Ramapo, the Ramapo or here and in New Jersey and in the Highlands. But the word Ramapo is really a, a Connecticut language word that really means slanted rock. And so you see the word Ramapo all over the place. And it doesn't mean the Ramapo tribe or nation as it is today has anything to do with it. Ramapo nation has been on in the Ramapo Mountains for many thousands of years. But also there's a group that's come in from Connecticut is where, where that language comes from. But there are Muncie people and that was in a study made by the US Congress in 1951, trying to figure out who they were. And they decided they were Muncie. And so uh, to Brendan, uh, thank you for answering the question. Um, now the watershed gets low because Route 22, which is the White Plains Road, they called it the Common Path. And it's a high ridge that divides the Hudson from the waters that run to the East River. And they say if a raindrop falls on this common path, Route 22, or the Tulpehokee Trail, one part of it will roll right into the East River, another part will roll into Hudson, and the two peoples would would identify themselves by the water as it's flowing. And so it's a very, very close to the Hudson. So then it would be narrow. And then that didn't work. Okay. So exit. 
Okay, Hammond Asset Line, that's on the, uh, I mentioned that in this map of the Manhattan and it cuts across at the solstice angle. So the summer, uh, well, whatever it is, summer solstice sunrise and winter solstice sunset is really the same line. And so the natives, and I mentioned this in Native New Yorkers, that at Fort Pond and Montauk, they had that situation where they wanted to be able to bury their beloved people in these very elaborate graves, these very elaborate religious ceremonies, in a place so that where the sun would set over them and just you know cover them and soak down the grave in beautiful light of of the Creator. And we say the sun is like closest thing to Creator. And so these alignments would grow, and it ended up that one particular one went to Hammonasset, which is the next town in Connecticut, through the 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 crevasse between Plum Point and the end of the Plum Island, I think it is, and the end Orient Point. And then it kept growing all the way across the country. So that's, uh, and all along there's all these very significant kind of, uh, but, you know, they go all the way out and there's all these cairns and other stone constructions along that line in a corridor. Now, uh, that's, what I can say right now, Ham Asset Lion, and again, I've written about it in my book, which is based on the show that was um, in the mapping Native New York, talked a little bit about that, and also mapping Manahattawak. So, uh, Boyceville is very important that uh, 28 really goes through there, but the, the Pacton Trail connects with what's now 28 in Boyceville, and there's a number of these sacred stones there as well. And uh, so, this does. A lot of rivers uh, originate in the Shandakan area. A few trails, but mostly the rivers all seem to start. There's seven rivers that begin in this one town, a very large town. And there are various trails coming through there, most of them following these rivers. Um, now, Utsiyanta is, uh, I would say, U T S A N T H A. Um, it's in Shawnee. And uh, let's go to, I'm going to go to that one. So um, the last Algonquin, yeah, I've read a lot about that. I was asked to be in the movie, by the way. The movie never happened. Um, and I read it carefully, and we've gone over it with other scholars, and there seems to be quite a bit of authenticity there. I mean, there's a lot of people who immediately say, well, it's phony and all that, but that doesn't really, that's not the story. There's really quite a bit there that, um, you know, could be authentic, and so I'll hesitate a bit. And of course, then it comes down to, well, who is this? You know, who was Theodore Kazimierov? Really, I'm not sure that's really that relevant. I, I think that, you know, to try to make it into a, some kind of character thing is inappropriate. I think you have to look at how the story matches up with the geography, and I think it does. So that's my Jennifer. That's my thought about the last Algonquin. And it's also a very dramatic story that at least parallels actual historical uh, people of the Civil War era. Now, in terms of the smoke signals in the half moon, you know, there was this Robert Jewett on the ship. I mean, Henry Hudson, he had the same birthday as me, so I'm going to cut him a break. But Robert Jewett was a problem person. He, the problem with Henry Hudson, he kept hiring Robert Jewett to be his first mate, and he was very knowledgeable and scientific for his time, and yet he was a bit crazy. Uh, one way or another, and he ended up being very violent. And so, yes, when the uh, ship came back down to the Yonkers area, uh, Nipmishan, you know, where where the, uh, you know, where I guess Inwood Park is, they were attacked. But it was a nonviolent protest. They were protesting Robert Jewett and his behavior, but the people in the Moon didn't get it, and so it ended up being bloody. And the fact is they probably use smoke signals to transfer the message, this guy's trouble. But it didn't turn out well. So town of Poughkeepsie, uh, okay, but I'm gonna mention that uh, Helen Wilkinson Reynolds wrote a very small but important book called Poughkeepsie, The Origin and Meaning of the Word. And she goes into some detail more than anyone else about all the towns about Poughkeepsie. And I put them all in my map of Dutchess County so that people could, look at them and understand them. So her book is a bit hard to understand. And in my book called Mapping Native New York, um, 
to the website. Yeah, I made it as simple as I could. So there you go. There's more to that, but I don't have time. So uh, I do have maps of the West Nyack area. So if you write to me, I'll make a, a, a kind of a custom copy for you. It's not in the show. And it's in, I believe, one of those. I believe that's in uh, one of the books. Maybe it's Mapping Manhattan. But I do have maps of that, and I can send one to you, uh, Nicole, because uh, there's quite actually several maps of West Nyack, and that's where some ancient uh, mortar and pestles were found. Uh, I can't answer about the flag that's from here, Clarkson University. Um, so, but again, in terms of a Zoom chat, yeah, just use the website, algonquinculture.org, and my, my email is there. So I'm going to answer these. Well, there were more. Well, we going to have to be pretty quick, but yeah, five more minutes. Uh, Some of these are So this is the technical floor high list. Um, what we got? Right. Okay, this is a question about purchasing the maps if you want to just uh, say that. Uh, yeah, manage out high. Uh, it's been here. Yeah, the maps are, you can get through my website. They're not in stores, but um, I send them out. They're laminated. They're, most of them are 11 by 17. They tend to cost $10. And then there's larger ones. But, um, so we see, I think there was another West Sister. Uh, well, I thought there was another. Yeah, that was later on. Okay, Manitou is <clears throat> the word. <clears throat> for spirit. It literally means spirit and it's been used many other ways. Like Kichi Manitou means great spirit and that's that great spirit that's everywhere. But the word Manitou or Manitou or Manto means spirit linguistically. And so you see it in all different forms. There's Manitou Mountains as you see um, and there's you know like different variations on it. And there's also a word that the missionaries took to mean the devil, and so that created a lot of confusion for centuries, because people were afraid to use the word for spirit when somebody would think it meant devil, and so, and so, and it's, sorry about that. Um, did you see Michael Sisson's question? He put it in the chat. Yes, that's an interesting question. I addressed that specifically in the mapping Manhattan, in that, yeah, we don't, maybe want to use some of the conventional European terms. Uh, Confederacy is a term that almost seems like it applies, but it doesn't exactly. And the Dutch said it was more like a canton, the way that the sachemdoms were organized. So people want to use the word nation, but they should use sachemdom if possible. And a sachemdom is made up of various villages that are able to come together. The sub-chiefs of the villages meet with the grand sachem of that group and a council, so that's your sachemdom. But these so the sachemdoms meet, the grand chiefs meet together, maybe less often, but then that would form either a confederacy or a canton, a canton, or a commonwealth is a very good term that applies. But a confederacy is, is highly organized and, and stable, and most of these weren't that stable, especially the Wapagers. So we use canton or commonwealth made up of many sachemdoms, each of which are made up of many villages. So that's my answer. And that should cover most situations. The problem is that these sophists were a very large group that we call it a canton. And the many think we're another one, but that's not how everybody refers to it. But if you look at the structures, it's right there. It's obvious. So there's five sachemdoms in the sophist canton. And the same thing with many things. So I think there's one more question. No, no. Right. Um, One more question here from Chris. Is about the Rhinebeck area? Now, the Rhinebeck area, yeah, that was uh, tricky because there was a landing for the important ferry crossing from King from Kingston Point, Kingston Beach area. And, and there's a part right on Kingston Point where there's a path 
right along that narrow ridge. It's the only place you could walk. And so you can kind of virtually say that was the original trail site. And then it's a very short crossing over to Rhine Cliff and then the trail that went through winding up the cliff and then descending 308 and then on out to Connecticut. So there's your, your crux of it. But this area was a landing area of the Muncie, the Sophus Muncie from the Kingston side. <clears throat> and you know, to also secure both sides of the ferry, which had a political implication, just to make sure everybody you know, could always cross. However, that's the Sapasco area. And then right above that is the part of the Mohican group, very strongly Mohican. And in Native New Yorkers write about how in the 1900s, there were still a few Mohicans self-identified, you know, people speaking the language and living more or less in the woods out there. And uh, Sapasco Lake was actually the Mohican group. That area of Wappingers and going out to uh, towards Pine Plains on the south side, that was really Wappingers and Kissing Mountain. That's, that's Wappingers. And then above that, you have Mohican. And there is overlap there. Um, they were very friendly with each other. And again, the, all on the west, on the east side of Dutchess County, you have actual Mohican settlements quite late. So it's hard to, you know, say. And in my Dutchess County map, I tried to you know, estimate where those borders were, again, based on, you know, watershed lines and treaty lines. So that's a good question. And I think, I'm not sure if there's a Okay, yes, Roseanne. So I talk about your thanks for the question, Great Wall of Manitou. That's a widely known expression and it's a thing. I mean, you can kind of go out there and if you're on the Hudson and you're you're sailing up the Hudson, like on the Clearwater ship, you can see this Great Wall of Manitou. It's uh these very sacred the mountains are sacred. In other words, they're full of spirit, which is Manitou, and they're great. And it's like a wall. Well, the question is, what would be the word for wall in Muncie? And that's arguable. But there does seem to be words that, that relate to a similar concept of a wall. So I take it as being a legitimate term. Um, but as to where it's first mentioned, I'm not sure. But right there, it's from uh, Kingston up around Woodstock. It really starts just above Woodstock, as far as I'm concerned, and goes all the way up to the Catskill Creek area. And it's very high up. When I was looking for, uh, you know, we had Northern Lights a couple months ago. And so they said, and I went looking for them at night and driving around trying to find the best view. And guess where it took me? It's right to the overlook at, uh, you know, the old pine orchard. <clears throat> and that's where I found the best view. And that's on top of the that uh, we call the wall of management. So it is a, maybe a folk term, let's say, but it could very well have, I'm almost certain, has native roots. So uh, somebody called it Manitou, and this is an Algonquin word. And I just want to mention there that in terms of understanding the Algonquin people and what holds them together over the whole North American continent, Turtle Island, the word Manitou appears in some form with almost all those different languages and tribes across North America. So we are the people of Manitou. We are the people of, of spirit, not only those who wear the deer skin, but we're also the people of Manitou. We all use that word and have that same concept of great spirit, which is everywhere in every rock and leaf. And I leave you with that thought. Thank you. Wow. What a great place to stop. Um, thank you, Evan, so much for everything that you've shared with us today. It is an absolute honor. Thank you everyone for being with us. Uh, this journey, these maps, and all of Evan, Evan's works are clearly labors of love, and we are honored for him to work with us to share this with all of you. Uh, we have been talking together about creating an archive of this information here at Clarkson's Beacon Institute, both here at the Water Ecology Center and online so that they can be shared with all people in perpetuity. So please stay tuned and have a great day. Happy spring. Take care and we'll see you next time.